Good afternoon from Strasbourg and welcome to this workshop on diversity and inclusion in the audiovisual industries organized by the European Audiovisual Observatory. I am Maya Capello, I am head of the Department for Legal Information of the Observatory and together with my colleague uh, Julio Talavera and other members of the legal team which I will introduce later on, we will guide you together through this event from Strasbourg. Uh, as many of you may know, the Observatory is part of the Council of Europe and uh, what you might not know is that every year in December we organize a workshop in beautifully decorated for Christmas Strasbourg and we gather together for a full day of work experts from uh, various areas of the sector, academia, stakeholders, the public institutions to discuss a specific topic. Well, Corona has not allowed us to do it this year uh, but we will uh, try nevertheless to keep up the good habit by uh, holding our workshop online and also taking advantage of technology by opening up our doors. We have over 600 people registered for our event today and we are also live on Facebook. So uh, thank you everyone for being with us on Human Rights Day. This topic fits very well today's celebrations. Uh, we will discuss the theme of diversity and inclusion in the media. We will look at uh, non-discrimination and equality of conditions of underrepresented groups, both behind the camera and on screen. And we will look at diverse uh, reasons for discrimination, it can be ethnic or racial origin, nationality, sexual orientation, age, language, religious belief, disability, and so on. We will uh, look both at working conditions of minority or underrepresented groups in our first session dedicated to off-screen topics. And we will look at uh, how the, our diverse societies are represented on screen in our second session. Uh, just to guide you through um, a bit how the, uh, um, the workshop is going to be held, we will have a kickoff introduction from observatory, observatory team members for each session. Francisco Cabrera and Sophie Valle from the legal department will set the scene. They will then be followed by three speakers who will introduce other central topics and we will follow with a roundtable discussion with selected stakeholders. During this discussion, all of you following from your screens at home, you're most welcome to interact. You can ask questions or post remarks in the Q&A box. You can tell where you're writing from or listening from in the chat box and this you can do both from the Blue Jeans platform and on the Facebook Live. My colleague Lia Chouchon will uh, assist you and guide you through the boxes and also feel free to tweet. May I suggest that you use the hashtag diversity and inclusion. To give our own contribution to inclusiveness, we have also tried to make this event accessibility friendly. So you will see that you have the possibility to active captions for subtitling in the bottom right corner of your screen. There will also be subtitles in the first contribution who will launch the workshops and, and uh, Francisco Cabrera will set the scene with his introductory video. Uh, Francisco is senior legal analyst in the Department for Legal Information at the Observatory and I would now like to ask my colleague Alison Heindaf, our press manager but today vision mixer, to launch the video. Enjoy! Let me tell you a story. Or even better, a few stories about extraordinary people. Let's start with Artemisia. Artemisia was a 17th century painter and quite a talented one at that. But for centuries, she was mostly known for having been raped by a fellow painter and for the rapist's ensuing trial. Like many other female artists before and after her, her brilliant artistry was mostly ignored until recently. Piotr was one of the greatest composers that have walked the earth. Swan Lake, Nutcracker, I'm sure you all know them. But like many other homosexual artists before and after him, he had to keep his private life in a closet. Gustav, on top of being a great composer, was a world-famous conductor. He actually got the job coveted by every musician in Vienna, director of the Imperial Opera. He only had to overcome a professional barrier. He was Jewish, and so he had to convert to Catholicism in order to get his dream job. 
censored, ignored, closeted, forced to convert and to conform. For centuries, society's views on race, religion, gender or sexual orientation have made the lives of these and other people far more painful than they should have been. But sometimes it is not society, but rather nature that gets in the way, making things more difficult for certain people. Ludwig wrote his greatest works at a time when he had become almost completely deaf. Joaquin became blind at the age of three and had to write his compositions in braille. Claude's vision was affected by cataracts, but continued painting wonderfully, the same as Henri or Frida, whose talents were not impaired by their mobility restrictions. Now, let's move on to the 21st century and to the audiovisual sector. We all like cinema, TV, VOD, internet, social networks and what have you. Actually, it looks as if we are living our lives in front of one or many screens. But behind these many screens, a mostly anonymous crowd is at work. With their contributions, some creative, some technical, they are instrumental in shaping what we see and hear on screen. Now, the world that Artemisia, Piotr or Gustav had to navigate is not today's world. Many things have changed. Society has changed. Technology has changed. And very importantly, the law has changed. In Europe, there's an important body of legislation and case law that prohibits discrimination on many grounds. The European Convention on Human Rights, the European Social Charter, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union and the EU treaties, they all speak out against discrimination. In 2000, the European Union adopted two directives, the Employment Equality Directive which prohibits discrimination in the area of employment on the basis of sexual orientation, religion or belief, age and disability, and the Racial Equality Directive, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of race or ethnicity in the context of employment, but also in accessing the welfare system and social security, as well as goods and services. There are also further directives regarding equality between men and women. Despite this, there are still gaps in EU anti-discrimination law. Some protected grounds, sexual orientation, religious belief, disability and age, are only protected grounds in the context of employment. In 2008, the European Commission presented a proposal for a Council Directive that aimed at extending protection against discrimination through a horizontal approach. But so far, unanimity has not yet been reached in the Council and the draft remains blocked to this day. At national level, legislators and regulators have provided a diversity of tools and mechanisms to promote equality and fight discrimination. For example, by imposing obligations on broadcasters, particularly public service ones. Film funds make public funding conditional on the fulfillment of equality and diversity criteria. The European audiovisual industry has also stepped in, introducing new policies aiming at increasing diversity and promoting inclusion in the sector. Does this mean that all problems are solved? No! no. And that is precisely why we are here today. Let's talk about it. Well, after this uh, very inspiring journey, I think that our engines are well warmed up. So I'm very pleased to introduce our speakers for this first session. We have with us Amy Thurker. She is project manager at Creative Diversity Network at Diamond. And uh, I think she will appear on screen. There you are, Amy. We have also Pauline Durand-Bial. She is uh, CEO at the Federation of European Screen Directors. Welcome, Green. And we have Daphne Tepper. She is uh, director at Uni Europa. And I think you will also appear very soon. Welcome, all three. 
You will guide us through three main areas of, uh, of screen issues. We will talk about data collection, gender pay gap, good practices, and maybe there will also be some worse practices. But let's start with Amy Turton. Um, she is, as I mentioned, the projector manager at the Creative Diversity Network, CDN, and Diamond is the TV industry's diversity monitoring project conducted on behalf of five main UK broadcasters. In particular, Amy is responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the project. She produces Diamond's records and scoping out its future development. So, Amy, I think you will uh, go to now start to explain how Diamond works. Uh, it would be great to know how you gather your data and also the main results of your study. The screen is yours, Amy. Lovely, thank you. Um, I've got a, a, a quick presentation. Um, it's not as colorful as the video we just saw. Um, I thought I'd just quickly introduce Diamond quickly and how it came about. Um, there was a question in our UK Parliament, which was how many, it was about 10 years ago, and the question was how many women over 50 work in UK television? And nobody knew the answer to this. And it was felt that actually we should know the answer to this if we're concerned about diversity um, and equality. And thankfully, the broadcasters, the main broadcasters, decided to tackle this question together. They already, luckily, had a shared um, software platform where they were collecting rights management information, and they expanded it to create diamonds um, so that they could collect data on six diversity characteristics. And this is data about cast and crew who were making programs for the five main broadcasters. So it's not diversity data about the broadcasters themselves, which is monitored by the regulator, but about the many um, producers and, and many freelancers among them who are actually making the programs. And how it works is actually sounds really simple. So the name and email address of every cast and crew member is entered into a, this, this system. And then via the email address, they're sent a diversity form. The contributor fills in the form and it all goes into a big database, which we can then report from. Our reporting focuses mainly on genres and role types. Um, and at CDN, we produce the kind of industry overview of the data and broadcasters can produce data at a more local level so that it can inform the conversations that they have with their um, suppliers and production companies. And of course, it's not just about data for data's sake. Um, there are kind of strategic ambitions around diamonds and the reason why it was set up the way it was. The first is it was really important. That this was about long term monitoring. So previously, there have been many, many diversity initiatives, but they've all been quite short term. And it, that was kind of a short term output, short term monitoring. What we're trying to understand is what really makes that transformative change across the whole industry. There's, of course, an accountability around it all. And the fact that everyone's collecting data in the same way helps because it, it, it prevents that um, competition of perhaps collecting data in different ways and presenting it in a way that is most favorable for what your message is. It also encourages um, organizations to set targets, which wasn't possible before without the data. So now many of the broadcasters have set diversity targets. And it adds to the conversation that was happening before we had data. So before that, it was all about who could shout loudly about the thing that they were concerned about with regards to diversity and inclusion. And actually, the data helped give a voice to those who never even had one in the first place. This slide is um, very dense. Uh, apologies for that, that's a bit more colorful than my bullet points before. And um, this is from our third year of data. Um, and I just pick out some of the highlights really. The first thing that we have learned from this data collection is that disabled people are probably the most underrepresented across all of TV production, both on screen and off screen. So, for example, only 5.2% of contributions were made by disabled people, despite the UK workforce population being about 17% disabled. The other thing that we've looked at is the difference between on-screen and off-screen roles. So we found that actually diversity is a lot better on-screen than off-screen. And I think for, for a little while, it's been hiding the fact that there is a diversity problem off-screen, because I think... Through, cast, through better casting, we've been able to kind of show a more diverse range of people on screen. And I think people have, have felt that that's probably happening off screen, but of course it, it isn't. It's, it's sort of masking the fact that there's still a lack of diversity off screen. The, and the, the third thing is about the, the 
key roles like directors and writers where we find women and those from um, black, Asian, minority, ethnic groups are, are not represented as, as well as they are in, in other roles. So although women make up a lot of the off-screen roles, they, they make 53.7% of contributions, um, they, they are only 26.2% of contributions by directors are by female directors. So it sounds kind of quite simple, the diversity collection and reporting, but it, it really isn't. Um, and I think of, obviously in diversity monitoring, I think the key challenges are one, trying to get people to actually fill in their form in the first place. Um, and the fact that it's ongoing collection, so this isn't a workforce survey, a sort of one out, um, go, go out, try and capture some data and come back. The data is constantly moving, which is a real challenge. Um, also, introducing data into what was previously a campaigning space has been quite interesting because if the data says it kind of matches what people had been saying before, they say, oh, well, we knew that anyway. What was the point of, of Diamond? But if it says something slightly different, then people tend to want to dismiss the data rather than what the kind of status quo about the situation has been. And the other thing as well, in television diversity, the conversation has mainly been around females and um, ethnic diversity, whereas actually in Diamond, we collect data for six protector characteristics. So it's really broadened the idea of diversity out. And there's been a bit of um, a kind of cajoling, I suppose, to take over that space and to kind of reprioritize within the different um, protected characteristic groups. In terms of what next, um, obviously it's more, more monitoring and reporting. We're about to publish our fourth report, and it's interesting to see where there is there is a little bit of progress in some areas, but in some others it's it's really stagnant and there's nothing really new to say, apart from that you there's still a lot of work to be done. And it's quite hard to keep reiterating that same point. Um, the other thing is, although Diamond is good at kind of monitoring those long term changes within the industry, we really need to have better evaluation of the initiatives or um, actions that are taking place so that when we see that something has worked, we can really understand why it's worked so that we can replicate it and, um, uh, and, and scale it up and, and use it in other areas to to produce those positive effects in other parts of the industry. Thank you, Amy. Uh, I think you managed to uh, put the finger on the difficulties that are behind the data gathering process. I'm a bit curious uh, how privacy rules interact on this, if there are some difficulties in storing also this data, are people willing to give them out? And what is the dark side of the story? Is there some uh, main <laughs> difficulty that you would like to uh, highlight? I think it's been it, obviously. I think when 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 we were putting Diamond together, data security and privacy was obviously uh, paramount, and it was before the new uh, general data protection regulations came in. But everyone was kind of quite keen to find out what those were, so that we would be compliant when it got to the point that they came in in the UK. Um, I think the security bit is quite hard. It, it's more and it, it's more about the reporting because people always want very detailed data. Um, and we've had to sort of say, well, we don't we can't give you that because it would it would, you know, there's a potential that people will be identified if we give you data at that very, very, very level. And it's, I, I, I don't know why. I think some people just want to see it at that very granular level. So we really have to push back at people who want to see the data of particular programs or what did this soap opera on this day look like? Um, in terms of diversity. And of course, it's not really about that because it's about changing the industry and it's about looking more over kind of a whole channel or, as I said, across a whole genre or across a role type. Um, but it, yeah, it's certainly it's always a concern. And, and I think in turn, people have to feel reassured that we do really look after their data um, because obviously that, that will impact whether they and I imagine as well that data collection is done also in other countries. Uh, do you have a feeling of uh, being UK a place where that gathering is more difficult or easier than other countries? You interact with other colleagues, I guess, from other countries? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think um, we're lucky that in the UK diversity monitoring is a, is a thing and it's expected um, more than perhaps in other countries. So there is, um, it, it, it's more of a requirement, and I think individuals who are filling in the forms as well know that. They're used to filling out a diversity form when they join the doctor's surgery or enrol their child at school, or we fill them out more and more. 
So I think that really helps in terms of engaging people, or at least people are aware that it is just part of life and it's a normal way of working. Sure, I guess that normalization is indeed uh, a key element here, and we, I'm sure also we will hear more about that later on. Well, thank you, Amy, for having shared your experience. We will uh, bring you in later on, but uh, now I would like to uh, pass the floor or pass the screen to our next speaker, uh, Pauline Van Bien. She is the chief executive of FERA, the Federation of European Screen Directors, since February 2014. And since this morning, she is also the chairperson of the advisory committee of the European Audiovisual Observatory. So I'm very pleased that this is your first public appearance in your new capacity at this event. Congratulations, Pauline. Um, Pauline is uh, here to share the experience about gender pay gap. Here, data also play an important role. And uh, this has been collected throughout the audiovisual industry on the basis of a European survey on the remuneration of audiovisual authors, which has been carried out by FERA and, F and, the, and the Association of the Screenwriters in Europe. So I would very much like you, Pauline, to share your experience and also your screen. So the screen is yours. Well, do. Thank you, Maya, very much for this uh, lovely introduction. Um, well, I think I'm going to just uh, jump right into it um, and share the screen right now with you so that you can follow uh, me in this uh, little figure journey. So, first of all, um, here in the study, we I think one of the, the important um, basic points that uh, was made was that uh, what the status of the workforce was in terms of gender balance. And as far as our study, which is a European-wide study, shows, we have a 36% female uh, audiovisual authors workforce, which means that uh, in, this, uh, in this percentage you have screenwriters, directors, composers, uh, cinematographers, and a number of other audiovisual authors, which can be defined as such uh, in, uh, in certain countries. Um, voila, so that's the basics. Now, for the, um, for, for, for comparison sex, this shows you typically the discrepancy that you're going to find between the reality of the female workforce and the reality of female, uh, directors or screenwriters actually engaged in production in certain recent figures that were published uh, for example, by the observatory, which usually top, if I remember correctly, more around 20% of the content. Uh, and that shows you that there is there already a gap uh, to, to be looked at. But more specifically, and as much as uh, the pay gap is concerned, here is uh, what I will help you look at quickly. Basically, uh, our study looked at audiovisual authors' yearly income after tax. Uh, remember here that we're talking about people who are uh, generally uh, educated, highly skilled, highly trained. Huh? Uh, and uh, here what you have is the median yearly income of, of these people. And if you look at the figures, you will see that for directors, we are looking at uh, 12,500 euros uh, per year for work as a director uh, across an entire um, yeah across an entire year I just said and uh, eighteen thousand for male and for screenwriters we're looking at uh, twenty three thousand five hundred and twenty five thousand uh, for male so the difference between these two positions the directors and screenwriters also explains the difference uh, in the level of yearly remuneration as a director or a screenwriter. Uh, it's basically the workflow. Uh, usually, uh, as a director, you cannot necessarily work on uh, several shootings at once. Uh, we're only human beings here, so there are certain things that we cannot commit to, even for survival. Uh, but uh, but voila, that's that's the general picture in terms of discrepancies that is always quite striking, I find. Um, and to, to survive, you can see that directors in particular have to work other jobs, uh, maybe in the industry, sometimes as a screenwriter, cinematographer, or what have you, or outside the industry, typically as teacher. You can see here uh, the low percentage of 55% um, of share of income uh, over a year coming from their work as a director. 
which is quite striking. And that shows how unsustainable uh, career patterns they have to face and uh, little chances to grow in the job unless they're extremely, uh, let's say, stubborn and dedicated. Uh, as a direct consequence of working on less projects, they also get a smaller share of uh, royalties payments than their male counterparts, because, of course, if you've worked on less films or less TV series, you generate less royalties. Um, voilà, that, for example, typically will have an impact uh, in, uh, in uh, survival during COVID-19. Uh, royalties payments from uh, previous exploitation of, of your previous works have been extremely helpful in this uh, in this difficult 2020 year well typically again female directors uh, are not exactly well positioned in that uh, in that department so what are the next slides uh, i will show you here um, is really a perfect illustration of the glass ceiling effect uh, that uh, female uh, audiovisual authors go through uh, throughout their careers as you can see, uh, pretty much uh, they, they begin their careers on an equal footing with their male counterparts. At some point, it stabilizes, and then it just hits the ceiling uh, in around uh, 50 years old. This is this is what the data shows us. Uh, then the uh, decrease uh, in terms of income is uh, is quite typical of uh, the of these uh, of these jobs as well. Um, there is one explanation here, which is that uh, when in order to survive, you train people uh, to do your job. Well, at some point when in your career, you become a little bit more expensive, you're replaced by the younger generation, which you have yourself trained, which is uh, quite uh, dreadfully ironic. But here you go. So just I'm going to stop sharing now and I will, I, we will share um, the slides um, uh, when uh, when the time comes, um, I I just wanted also to point out that um, in terms of good practice, I'm afraid I'm not aware of any significant uh, good practice that I could share with you today on uh, how to uh, bridge the gender pay gap uh, in itself. There are a number of um, of uh, measures and and uh, policies that exist in terms of access to funding, but it's slightly different from bridging the gender pay gap itself. And there, I think uh, this can be explained by the fact that uh, working conditions and income related issues are massively difficult to tackle in our industry for a number of reasons, which I won't go into uh, now, but there are two points uh, here that are still important to underline. One is that um, for a freelance workforce, uh, as audiovisual authors are working project per project, improving uh, pro the, the, the professional collective representation and the ability to collectively bargain for these professions is absolutely essential in bridging the gender pay gap, but also in addressing a wider range of social related issues. Um, and, and in terms of bridging the pay gap uh, from another perspective, the right leverage will, of course, very much depend on uh, national labor frameworks, but as well on the uh, decision making process in terms of investment, private and public. And I think that's something that um, the panelists and, uh, and the other speakers on the event will go into. Now, to, to wrap this up, um, I'd like to just share a couple of thoughts with you on the link between off-screen and on-screen in this, in this debate and how it relates to the gender pay gap. Um, well, I mean, if, if, you, if you consider uh, the picture that I just painted for you, uh, the, the current state of the workforce uh, is very much one of an, a median uh, educated wild, white male over 40. 45, basically. And that socioeconomic profile definitely uh, is a factor in what ends up uh, on screen. Um, it's, uh, it's very much a matter of individual, uh, corporate and institutional responsibility uh, for everyone who is involved in the decision making process regarding what stories are told um, and how. Uh, we know who these, uh, who these key, uh, who these key pressure, well, not pressure points, but who these key people are. They're the commissioning parties on the one end, uh, be it broadcasters, online platforms, or public funding bodies for the more author-driven creative process. 
But Pauline, I jump in on this because we will come back to the commissioning parties, but I have a question here from the audience about collection of data in case of international co-productions. Does this change, in your view, the picture? Because I understand the data that you have presented, they are um, for national productions, or what is the scope of, of the data collection? The data collection is very much, uh, the, 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 the entry point here was very much uh, identifying the structure of the yearly income for audiovisual authors. So it is not based on the balance of one type of budget. It's very much based on the economic reality of the community on the ground. Um, so uh, figures concerning co-productions would be included in the data, but uh, in order to give you an idea of the discrepancies between the types of productions, I would have to uh, dig back into the, uh, the data set itself. I see. And we have also another comment. Here is from the authors, uh, Dominique Lucquer mm -hmm. and uh, actors. Uh, actors, sorry. <laughs> uh, he, and he points to the fact that there might be a lack of horizontal measures upholding diversity and inclusion. But certainly, fundamental human rights principles already in the EU are key that plays a role. And uh, he wonders how these, uh, why these principles are not enforced enough. Do you see? A general problem here about enforcement that could come maybe from general principles? Maybe. I mean, uh, it's, uh, as I said, we're, we're looking here at a, a form of collective responsibility, and uh, responsibility can be uh, brought by general principles, by the law and by regulation, but it should also be something that comes more naturally from the ground. Uh, and I agree that at some point there is no point in being naive. Uh, clearly, if you don't have uh, a form of uh, accompaniment uh, and, and a proactive policy, you don't get anywhere. I think uh, uh, gender equality issues in general shows you that pretty pretty clearly. But for me, in a way, the saving grace can come from some changes in the market. And I know it's a bit counterintuitive because uh, life is not easy for anybody at the moment. But it so happens that... Um, in a way, the reconnection with the audience might be our saving grace because with changes in audience behavior, um, uh, changes also occur in the commissioning party's uh, logic. And, and to, to say that very bluntly, basically, we have now global streaming platforms in the market who are themselves struggling with the issue of representation because they are releasing global entertainment across uh, the entire globe, and they have to consider these sensitivities. And that might be a way for us to be challenged in our own turf of not having addressed these issues with regards to our own audiences here in Europe. We will hear more on that. We have Netflix with us, so I'm sure that we will get a little insight from a global perspective. But so far, thank you, Pauline, for sharing your experience. We will now move on to our third speaker, Ms. Daphne Tepper. She is director at the MEI Department of Uni Europa, and for the last three years, she has been coordinating a research project on gender equality and diversity. So it's a nice continuation with what we were talking about with Pauline. And she's been looking at the European audiovisual sector on behalf of a broad partnership of industry stakeholders. So I understand, Daphne, that you are ready to present now the results of this project and also a good practice handbook. So we might also hear from you about some positive stories. The screen is yours, Daphne. Um, so indeed, I will uh, present uh, the good practice handbook that um, we have been preparing with a broad um, European industry partnership in the last two years. Um, it's the outcome of a mapping exercise that was launched in uh, 2018. And uh, this mapping exercise uh, was implemented by the social partners of the European Social Dialogue Committee in the audiovisual sector, namely the public and commercial broadcasters, the European Broadcasting Union, the Association of Commercial Televisions in Europe, and the Association of European Radios, Film and TV Producers, the European Audiovisual Production Association, CEPI, the International Federation of Film Producers Associations, FIAP, and trade unions representing journalist cast and crew, the European Federation of Journalists, the International Federation of Actors, the International Federations of Musicians, and Uni Europa Unimei. 
Um, it's a long list of organizations, but I think it really shows the commitment of this broad partnership of taking the topic of gender equality and diversity seriously and of committing to it. So I thought it was really important to, to repeat how uh, this partnership was strong in the work it did in the last years. The project was a follow-up action of the adoption in 2011 um, by those our organization of a European framework of actions on gender equality in the audiovisual sector. Um, it's a document that put forward considerations and recommendations in five key areas, gender portrayal, equality of pay, equality in decision making, gender roles in the workplace, and reconciliation of work and private life. Um, the objective of the project was to evaluate progress since the adoption of the framework of action in 2011 and to identify and promote good practices. The main focus was on gender equality, but diversity in the broader sense was also discussed and researched. And the mapping exercise was implemented in different phases with desk research, an online survey, and then uh, interviews, face-to-face -face interviews in different European countries. And the key, key questions that guided um, our research were the following. What is the state of play regarding the presence of women on European screens and behind screens and sets? Is the sector fair to women in terms of pay, um, opportunities, and uh, career prospects? Uh, do televisions, radio, and film productions reflect our European society? What has been put in place to combat discrimination? What is working and what is missing, etc.? Next slide, please. Um, so the Good Practice Handbook presents the results of this research. Uh, it outlines some of the data and statistics that are available about the presence of women in the European audiovisual sector, as well as a series of uh, good practices and lessons learned. So first, uh, the publication underlines the importance of data, targets, monitoring, and reporting. So from the conversations we held and the data we could collect, it is clear that progress on the gender equality front can only happen through a voluntary approach that is based on facts and that is regularly monitored, strategies and action planned without resources or without targets are useless and they can even be counterproductive if they are seen as the end point rather than la the launching pad of the action. Second, our research demonstrated again the importance for the promotion of gender equality and diversity, um, and the importance of conditioning uh, public funding, um, and the role of the public broadcasters and the audiovisual regulators, as they can indeed play a key role in encouraging the, the sector to transform, transform some of the traditional patterns that lead to imbalances. The handbook also highlights the need uh, to continue raising awareness, um, organizing training, committing organizations and people to change, as this is the only way to make visible and understandable the structural discriminations that still persist between women and men in our sector and in our societies, and then act upon them. Next slide, please. Um, next to those uh, important structural uh, transformation, the publication also shows how through small and concrete steps, the audiovisual sector can change the way it works to achieve genuine and lasting change on the gender equality front. That concerns measures as straightforward as adjusting the organization of work to make it more friendly to families or reviewing recruitment processes to make them fairer and more open. Of course, the publications also highlight some of the initiatives taken in the audiovisual sector to combat sexual harassment in the aftermath of Me Too, and uh, it, outlines, it outlines how promoting safe work environments should be a central element of any gender equality strategies. And finally, the publication discusses how diversity has become more and more important indeed for audiovisual stakeholders, and it gives examples on how it has started to be worked on in different European countries by different uh, sector stakeholders. Next slide, please. Um, the handbook and the recording of the webinar, um, um, we organized in June to accompany the launch of the publication um, uh, are available online. Next slide, please. Uh, the, hand, the handbook is available in English, French, German, and Spanish. Next slide, please. 
and we sincerely hope um, it can help and inspire more actions to be taken in the sector in the months and years to come. Next slide, and we and I'm done. Uh, if we get to the last one, uh, you will have uh, the address of the website where you can find the publication and where you can really look into the different actions and good practices we have identified across Europe and implemented by different stakeholders, broadcasters, producers, trade unions and um, film funding bodies and regulators and all across the industry and across um, the value chain. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, um, Daphne. I will see if I manage to get back to myself. Yes, I am here on the screen. That was great, and I loved the illustrations. That was also uh, very, very nice to see, so I was very happy that we managed to put your, your the slides on the screen. Many lessons learned there. What is the most important to you? Um, and then I also liked this idea of moving from equality to diversity and strategies. Uh, play together. Could you uh, just maybe add something on these on these points? Yes, thank you for the help indeed with the with the presentation. Um, I think one of the key lessons learned really is that the the change on the gender equality front has been too slow in the last years, um, and that to happen uh, it really demands commitments at different level of our organization and across the industry, but that it can and should happen more radically in the next years now. Like, that you co is not acceptable anymore, and I think that's something that's really um, taking prominence in our sector. Um, and the relationship between gender equality and diversity, I think in uh, many of the conversations we had uh, in the different U European countries, we realized that when we look at ourselves and that our industry to count women and men, we cannot do that anymore without also noticing that we are a very male sector, but we are also a very white male sector, and we are a sector that, that is too uniform, and that we have to address that, and that it has to be done urgently in parallel, that there are some synergies that can be created between clearly between gender equality strategies and diversity ones, but also that the gender equality targets should not be lost um, because there is still work to be done to get to the 50-50 target and very deep transformation to be done and that if we lose the targets, we really take too much of a risk to go back to the situation that, that was before of slow change, way to slow change. So I think we should address the two, um, the, the two issues very seriously, very urgently, but without looking sides of where we want to get. Yeah, indeed. And uh, may I also add a little figure of proudness from the observatory. I ask you to do a little inquiry on how we are there. And we are 63% female. So I think that is something worth to uh, also mention that uh, behind the scenes, you have also those who study the audiovisual industries. And there is a lot of work going on there as well. We have a question from the audience. Uh, interesting also because we are in Strasbourg in France. It's about ethnic data. So um, we have a question from Christian Arora, and he says that I understand that in France it is against the law to collect ethnic origin data on French citizens. How does this affect development of diversity in France, etc.? Are these data that you collect uh, in, your, um, in your data gathering? No, what we did is that we um, asked the question in the different countries, do you collect data? Can you collect data? Is it legally possible to do it? And we started a conversation there, and, and clearly um, we realized that it's it's very difficult to collect data in some countries. You you can't, or you're very limited in doing so. But also the diversity, the type of diversity is of course different from one country to another. So one of our conclusions were clearly that there is no need to necessarily harmonize the way we count, but there there are nevertheless many actions you can take to move from the very um, not diverse workforce we have right now. And there are many steps, and that's what we highlight in the publication in France, where it's um, illegal to count certain um, uh, characteristics. There are still extremely interesting um, um, initiatives that have been taken to uh, 
diversify recruitment processes, to set up new types of partnership, net partnerships to bring in new types of uh, people in the workforce. Um, there is many things you can do in the diversity front without necessarily having um, targets such as you have in the UK where you actually can, that the legislation allows you to do it. Um, but so there is many things you can do without targets. Uh, well, for the gender equality front, the targets are clear and they are a lot easier to manage. Yeah, indeed, legislation and diversity, they play a big role here. So thank you for sharing your experience. We will, uh, I'm sure we will have the chance to bring you in still. I would like now to bring in our uh, participants to the discussion. And we have six uh, distinguished uh, panelists that join us now. And we have uh, Stefan Trömmel, he is Senior Disability Specialist of the International Labour Organization. We have Camille Laville, advisor at the research unit of the Belgian media regulator CSA. We have Annika Rasanen, she is uh, working at Public Affairs of Netflix. We have uh, Pilar Oreiro, members of the ICT expert group of the European Disability Forum. Laura Holgat, she is uh, CEO at UNIQUE, the International Union of Cinemas. And Halvard Gjørset uh, of the Anti-Discrimination, Diversity and Inclusion Steering Committee of the Council of Europe. Welcome to all of you. I'm sure you will bring in uh, further aspects uh, to complete the picture. And uh, I would like to uh, start from the broader picture. Uh, since we have been touching upon working conditions, I would like to move to Geneva, where the uh, International Labour Law Organization is based and, and Stefan Trömmel, uh, because I believe that the uh, ILO is working on a, on a report and a survey. Uh, we had a little chat about that a survey concerning diversity and inclusion. And I think it would be very interesting to share some impressions from the work you are doing. Stefan, the floor, the screen is yours. Thank, thank you, Maya. Um, yes, we, uh, we are planning to do a survey like uh, this uh, early next year uh, in the corporate sector, so beyond the audiovisual um, industry. But we've already done a sort of a bit of a research in preparation of that. And I just want to share very quickly, very telegraphically, a few of the of the main points that we have identified. One is there is a lot of talk in the corporate sector about uh, diversity and inclusion, a lot of commitment also at CEO level, but then we feel that um, that, all, that this is not always leading to, uh, to concrete action and, and results. Also quite clear that the business case seems to be uh, very obvious uh, for diversity, but at the same time, that then there's a sort of a paradox there. The business case is clear, but the uh, but the actions are not, are not there. So we are trying to identify, and that would be one of the objectives of the survey, what are the barriers that are standing in the way of um, diversity inclusion? Is it a lack of how to do it? Is it a, a lack of adequate uh, global support? Uh, is it the people that are the, in charge of diversity inclusion? Do they have the adequate authority within the organization to promote these issues? I think it's also very important to distinguish between diversity and inclusion. And especially, I mean, we have been a lot of, questions come out on the data issue. Of course, there are challenges in terms of the data around diversity, also in the disability context, for instance, uh, there's an issue of very often of self-identification, and then you need to, to show to people why you're asking those questions and, and to hope that they, um, let's say, uh, self-identify as having a disability, but you cannot force that on them. But I think when, when that is just a diversity element, and, and the, of course, the more grounds we look at, uh, the more difficult it, it becomes. But then it's also the issue of inclusion. I mean, how how much can we can we how can we measure whether an organization is not only diverse in its workforce composition, but whether all of these uh, individuals that have that come with different with different grounds, sometimes intersecting grounds, uh, how well are they sort of um, respected in the organization? This you know this concept of sense of belonging, and I think that becomes it makes it even more complex. But perhaps, and that's a food for thought, perhaps by measuring the, the inclusive part, we can perhaps address some of the, the, the problems that we have on, in terms of measuring uh, the diversity grounds. So, um, last, last idea, I just that's, want... Uh, yeah, please. Last idea is just, uh, that I think there's a, there's a rise in the intersectionality discussion. And I think it, while the intersectionality in itself has its own uh, elements, I think perhaps there's also a way through which through that to sort of uh, break down some of these silos. No, it's, it's not about uh, this this ground versus the other ground. A lot of uh, individuals have different grounds, and I think we need to find ways to deal with all of those issues 
in the same way and avoid these, these hierarchies that very often uh, are in, in, the, in the diversity and inclusion uh, arena. Indeed, intersection is an important uh, issue, and we will hear certainly uh, from other speakers as well. Thank you very much, Stefan, for sharing your experience. Uh, we have talked about legislation, uh, and we have also public institutions that play uh, very important roles at national level, such as the regulators. And I would like to bring in Camille Laville uh, from the Belgian CSA because they have produced a barometer on diversity and equality, which draws a bit of an inventory of equality and diversity in the various TV services that are active in the Wallonia Brussels Federations. It's, uh, it's very interesting what the work you are doing with regard to gender, origin, age, social professional categories, disability. So, Camille, can you tell us the very key findings of your research on this? Yeah, uh, thank you, Maya. I will briefly review the different studies about equality and diversity conducted at uh, the CSA in Belgium. Since uh, 2011, we have conducted barometers and studies about equality and diversity on screen. And uh, more specifically, the CSA has conducted five editions of a diversity and equality barometers. The aim is to draw up an inventory, as Maya said, of equality and diversity in the various TV service, in the life of gender, origin, age, etc. Um, since the last edition, the barometer has included a specific, a specific study on the participation and representation of women and men in commercial communication. And last year, for the first time, we conducted a barometer on radio program and commercial communication. But uh, the good news is uh, that um, of script. Over the last year, the CSA conducted a heavy and long investigation about off-screen gender equality. We studied the obstacle and ongoing mechanism in the audiovisual industry and their impact on the careers of women. The report is based on four main pillars, access to position with responsibility, horizontal segregation, work-life balance, and the form of sexism, discrimination, and violence against women in the audiovisual industry. We combine qualitative and quantitative methodology and explored various fields with various means questionnaire to the management of audiovisual companies, and an anonymous questionnaire filled by 400 professionals, interviews, and an analysis of the trajectory of 758 uh, professionals through LinkedIn profile. We found that the, in the audiovisual industry of the French-speaking community of Belgium, 35 of percent of employees are male or women, and 65 percent are men. 22% of board members are women and 78% are men. We notice also an occupational breakdown by gender. Some roles in the audiovisual media sector are typically dominated by males, such as director, cameraman, whereas others seem dedicated to women, such as continuity person, for example, described by men and women as a supermom. Men are more represented uh, in top positions than women, and men represent 19, 90% profiles in the top and middle management. At the end of the study, the CSA formulated specific recommendations to the government and to the audiovisual media services. So if uh, you are interested, uh, our report is available on the CSA uh, website. So thank you for listening. Uh, that was great, and I invite everyone to go and take a look. I, I trust there is a link in the in the chat box. Now, uh, yeah. several uh, panelists have mentioned the issues of the commissioning parties. So this leads me uh, to bringing in uh, Annie Karasanen from Netflix, so that we can hear about the uh, strategies of Netflix in this regard. You we'll certainly have a more global overview, also with regard to other issues such as. Uh, ethnic origin or other aspects that maybe are, are not so evident here. We are also seeing from uh, most studies that the higher the whiter, so uh, it is a problem that of course is, is relevant. What is Netflix doing? I, 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 from our exchanges I was uh, very interested in your work. Annika, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Maya. These are really good questions and I'm happy to share my thoughts. First, I would like to thank you for inviting us to be part of this important event. It has been a pleasure to listen to this inspiring conversation. 
I would like to start by sharing a quote what diversity and inclusion means. It's by our inclusion and diversity department head, Verne Myers. Diversity is being invited to the party, but inclusion is being asked to dance. First, I would like to share what we have done on the corporate side, because that also reflects what we do off screen and on screen. Diversity and inclusion is important for Netflix because we have more than 195 million members around the world who want to see their life and experiences reflected on screen. Finding and telling these diverse stories has become a core part of our strategy. We have created Inclusion and Diversity Department in 2018. It aims to integrate inclusion and diversity into all aspects of Netflix's operations. Netflix also recognizes inclusion as a corporate value and helps all of its employees do it. Second point that I would like to make is that we have a decentralized decision-making model. It means that our executives around the world have creative and financial autonomy to make shows that inspire and excite them. They don't need to go to Hollywood and ask approvals from there. They can make decisions uh, locally here in Europe. Having these many decision makers from different backgrounds around the world naturally leads more diverse content on our service. One of our local initiatives to promote uh, gender diversity is Women Director Shadowing Program we have currently in Spain. In this program, junior women directors are shadowing experienced directors over filming of a full season of a series. The goal for these junior women is to uh, have an opportunity to direct an episode. Lastly, I would like to mention what we have done in the UK. This year, we have contributed to Ofcom's diversity report. The most interesting point here to highlight is the diversity and inclusion best practices guidelines for productions that are mentioned in the report. We have created these guidelines because we want to ensure that our shows are diverse in front of and behind the camera, and also that the working conditions on all our shows are inclusive. These guidelines set a range of aspirational targets that we would like to achieve for BMAE, gender, disability, and other minority groups. One example of these targets is to aim to have at least one BMAE writer in every writer's room. We will be using these guidelines going further in the production of our UK commissioned original series. I invite you all to read them, and if you have any feedback, I would be happy to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Anika. Indeed, we also see uh, questions from the reactions from the audience as to uh, the possibility of introducing quotas. Uh, I have also a remark as to the lack of diversity in our panel, but well, we are trying our best in bringing in those who are working on these matters. So uh, um, it's uh, it's not a given that we will find for each minority or underrepresented group also the person who is competent to intervene in the panel on it. So I hope the audience is uh, at least in position of appreciating the kind of efforts that are being made. It's uh, it's not an easy an easy process, and I think it's it's a beautiful uh, thing to uh, already see all the efforts that are being put in place. You mentioned disabilities, Anika, and I would like now to bring in uh, Pilar. Uh, she uh, is uh, working exactly on these issues and actually also inspired us in, uh, in introducing accessibility uh, measures for our, well, the, at least it's our very first attempt to introduce uh, capture filings. It's not a conference about accessibility as such, but more about how the disabled people are included in the working environment and uh, and then we will see also in the on screen so what is your experience pilar can you share the work of the european disability forum with us the screen is yours thank you um the disability forum uh basically what is interested is not well it would be fantastic if we could really look into the working conditions of people with disabilities in media but at the moment we're only looking at how people across Europe has access to media content. And media content goes from the news on television to 
to uh, any program by Netflix. Um, so this brings us to the issue of uh, how is accessibility done for people with disabilities to access content, and that is through basically subtitling uh, for the deaf, audio description for the blind, or sign language. These are the main um, issues that uh, are the main services for media accessibility. But of course, um, applying all these services to any media means is a cost. So what more often uh, is happening is that, for example, subtitling, which is the most common uh, service, is done automatically. So you would have um, automatic captions uh, or subtitles done. Uh, but that means, of course, that there are uh, minority languages in Europe, which are the majority of languages in Europe, that don't have these uh, automatic uh, engines for languages and automatic editors for subtitles. So it means that um, Europeans uh, with disabilities, and Europeans with disabilities doesn't mean just uh, people who are blind or who are deaf, talking about uh, the elderly, for example, or people who don't speak the language, for example. So it, it means that you don't have the access to media. So um, the, the access uh, across Europe to media uh, is not even. So people who speak uh, or live in a country that the media is in a, in a minority language will not have the same number of hours of subtitling or the description of someone living in a country with a larger uh, language where there are automated uh, solutions for media production of services. This is one, one important issue. So the other issue is that uh, we are talking all the time now about uh, people with disabilities accessing, but more and more often you would find that uh, consumers are becoming prosumers. So are people with disabilities being able to co uh, produce content uh, for, uh, for social media to exchange and that sort of issues. So we, we, we find that uh, I think perhaps languages is one of the most costly and uh, biggest uh, disability issue uh, across Europe. Uh, and it is very costly and there are some um, three directives that they are trying to um, I trust that. that you put the finger, Pilar, on a very important aspect, money. Uh, all this is uh, very costly and it's, uh, of course, not easy to do more than a, on a best uh, effort basis, maybe in the beginning. Obligations may be introduced and the directives you were about to mention certainly bring them in. But there is also a lot of good work being done spontaneously by the industry. I am thinking of, for example, mentoring programs and other measures to bring in inclusiveness. And we have with us uh, Laura Hogat. Uh, who is uh, um, the, the, uh, the, uh, now on screen, I guess, with us. And uh, she will uh, share with us the experience of the very important work that Unique is doing in order to bring in uh, the young people. Uh, it was mentioned young people don't steal the jobs of the elder ones that are kicked out, but it's also important that they are brought in and mentored in order to uh, have their professional lives. So uh, what is uh, your experience? Can you share a bit your success story? I think it was a nice story. Laura, the screen is thank, yours. Thank you, Mayas. Yes, so we... Um, we actually launched at UNIC, so the International Union of Cinemas, a mentoring scheme to support up and coming women in the industry. Uh, and this followed basically a, um, you know, observation we made uh, in our industry. There was a lack of women, you know, as you were going higher and higher uh, within managing positions. And we couldn't bring, of course, all the answers to the issue. But one of the answer was uh, launching a mentoring scheme. And it was about uh, creating a strong network also of professionals, uh, of women who would be able to support each other, also a pool for us to use uh, in panels and to give more visibility to women in general. So we launched uh, the scheme in 2017. Uh, so we're now uh, on the fourth edition. Uh, we have been covering a huge variety of countries. Uh, we've involved women from different companies. Um, and it's been really, it's been really, really successful for us. And I think what I would like to highlight is it's not, you're going to have challenges. You're going to have to convince people that it's not only the right thing to do, but it's also a good thing to do from a business case perspective. And this is something we did with our members. And, and I think proof of the success is 
on the first year of the scheme, it was quite challenging to actually gather enough applications uh, for mentees, but we're now already oversubscribed for next year. And looking at gender diversity also allowed us to look into more widely into the issue of diversity and what we could do uh, to also play our part. So you talk about young people, it's also something we've been looking into. Um, about you know making sure that we were also creating a program to encourage people to come in the industry and to stay in the industry, also looking at including um, much more diverse uh, group you know of people from an ethnical background, uh, because one of the speakers mentioned it you know it's a very male white over fifty industry um, in general, and we want to actually show that there's a completely different image that you can have. And if you want to attract and retain talents, uh, you really have to commit to it from diversity from all angles. You know, we've also looked into people with disabilities. So there's only so much you can do as a trade organization. But I think by sharing best practices like this, showing that if you, if you display strong commitment, you can actually make things change uh, has been for us really a, a true and valuable lesson. I I try I subscribe to that entirely. I, I think that the, I mean the, the the fact that from a success story there is another one being born and then leading to even over subscriptions to your initiative is the best recognition that you that you can get. You have mentioned many points, which brings me now back to a bit of an overview picture, which is on the word intersection. You said male, white, over 50, so this also obliges to look a bit into the, the subgroups in within the, the bigger groups. And I would like, therefore, to bring in uh, Halvar Gjurset. Uh, he's uh, chairing the steering committee on anti-discrimination, diversity and inclusion of the Council of Europe, and is connected from Norway today. Uh, and um, he, uh, this committee is doing uh, an extremely good work in order to promote equality for all and to build more inclusive society offering effective protection from discrimination and hate and also where diversity is respected. And the intersection issues are certainly some aspects that come very clear in your day-to-day -day work, I understand. Uh, can you share your experience with us? The screen is yours, Alvar. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Maya. Um, let me first of all thank you uh, or thank the Audiovisual Observatory for organizing uh, the, this workshop today on the International Human Rights Day. Uh, Non-discrimination and equality are, of course, fundamental principles of the European Convention on Human Rights and the other human rights instruments of the Council of Europe. And discrimination is unfortunately, unfortunately one of the most common forms of human rights violation, and it directly undermines inclusion and therefore also the very democratic security of European societies. So since some time now, uh, we unfortunately observe a growing trend of xenophobic rhetoric and hate speech in political life and in social media. We experience more open discrimination in everyday life and sadly also more hate crime targeting people based on their perceived different race, their ethnic origin, their color, language, religion or sexual orientation and gender identity. However, Discrimination can also be one of the most difficult human rights violations to recognize. Structural and institutional discrimination is not immediate, immediately visible, but it works through norms, through routines, patterns of attitudes and behavior. The uh, police killing of George Floyd in the US last spring uh, sparked demonstrations and intense debate also here in Europe, and this type of discrimination remains the main obstacle in ensuring equal opportunities and inclusion for uh, of minority groups. It is on this background that the composition of the audiovisual workforce is so important. For the audiovisual sector to be part of the solution, it must diversify uh, the profiles of its workforce to reflect the societies in which it operates. This, of course, goes through combating discrimination in employment and positive measures to equip persons and groups who are particularly experience racism and discrimination to compete on an equal footing with the others. I'd like to uh, highlight in particular the situation of Europe's 
10 to 12 million Roma who constitute the biggest, poorest and most discriminated ethnic minority we have. Anti-Gypsyism is a specific form of racism founded on racial superiority and dehumanization and resulting in deep-seated historical and institutional racism throughout Europe. We uh, at the Council of Europe have over the years actively sought to employ colleagues of Roma origin in our Secretariat to help strengthen our role in combating anti-Gypsyism. It's been a long process, uh, but we are now uh, starting to see results in this regard. I, I asked uh, before this event some of my colleagues, um, uh, of these colleagues, what they see as the main challenges for the audiovisual sector, where Roma, as we know, often appear in the context of very negative imaging, especially criminality. Uh, and my colleagues made three points that I would like to share with you as, uh, as uh, the ending of my intervention. First, there are few Roma on public news desks and councils of ethics and regulation to support pluralistic decision-making reflecting diversity in society. Second, underinformed media actors leads to journalism and audiovisual productions below quality standards, and there is a need to connect with uh, to valid Roma sources and uh, knowledge. Third, and finally, um, to create a more realistic and balanced image of Roma, more Roma origin directors, producers, and actors must be empowered to create and put their vision and own narratives into reality. Thank you very much. I'm very glad, however, that you brought in this issue of uh, Roma and relations because I see in the chat box that many are mentioning minority groups and racial and ethnic minorities. So then we have so brought in the good work that the Council of Europe is doing in, in this regard. Um, with this intervention, I would like to round up the first session, which uh, dealt with, so maybe um, Alison can uh, bring uh, our speakers on the screen before we hand over to Julio Talavera for the next session. We um, uh, will uh, move on to, um, off to online issues. And um, Julio uh, joined the European Audiovisual Observatory in 2013 and uh, has then been with the legal department. We can now have him on the screen uh, three years ago. He's also worked in uh, film production and he's very well placed to uh, take over on screen issues. So I would like to thank all participants from the first session. You're most welcome to uh, ask for the floor also in the second part. But now it's my pleasure to hand the screen over to Julio for the next uh, exciting topic. Julio. Thank you very much, Maya. It was Thank really you. interesting to listen to, to listen to all of you. Now, we have around 70 minutes to define what is on-screen diversity, give our audience some examples of the different approaches taken by the several <coughs> stakeholders, and discuss what works, what doesn't, what can be improved and what is in the pipeline. So we first will kick off with a general presentation to set the scene. Then there will be three additional presentations from the industry stakeholders. And after that, we will bring in five additional experts to join what I hope will be a lively discussion. Last, we will answer some of the questions from the audience. I see that right now we have around uh, 240 attendees, which is quite impressive. And you can ask questions questions in the chat box. So to begin with, I have my colleague, Sophie Vallet, who is a senior analyst at the Department for Legal Information here at the European Audiovisual Observatory, who will set the scene. Sophie will talk about the genesis of on-screen diversity and will try to explain why this is important. Sophie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Julio. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to session two. So, our diversity on and off screen, the two sides of the same coin. If we think of creative teams, script, script writers, directors, producers, it is easy to imagine that they are more inclined to address certain topics in their narratives or not to fall into certain stereotypes if they themselves come from underrepresented groups. However, the impact is less obvious if we talk about 
technical and administrative involvement. So I was saying that the, measuring the, the impact uh, of administrative and technical involvement is more difficult. For example, how far uh, does a diverse technical crew impact on the degree of inclusion uh, of the film in which they collaborate? Or does the composition of a film board have an impact on the degree of diversity on the films that will be selected for support or awarded? If we look into the media sector, for example, how far does the composition of an editorial team impact on the way the news are presented? Most of these questions are probably difficult to answer scientifically, but the fact is that most uh, diversity and inclusion approaches tend to address both on and off screen together, as we have seen already in session one. So let's go back in the early days of Hollywood, a bit the background in the next slide. The use of black and yellow faces by white actors was something common. We can think, well, uh, these, was, uh, these were other times. But as incredible as it might seem, this so-called whitewashing is still common in interpretation of characters belonging to minorities still today in Hollywood. The issue of diversity and inclusion in the audiovisual sector came under the spotlight in 2015 uh, in the US when the Oscar Academy awarded for the second year running the 20 Oscar nomination to white actors. This triggered a large social media campaign under the hashtag Oscar so white, and it forced Hollywood to revisit the, view, the, the issue of uh, on-screen representation and including the composition of the board of the Academy. This movement was followed by a constellation of other social movements like uh, White Washed Out for Asian representation or Time is Up for gender parity. And it did intensify the media attention on the film industry's treatment of historically marginalized groups. In the next slide, please. Um, uh, well, in the movie business, nothing is fed like bad press, and from then on, the studio have started the golden rush towards more diversity on screen. In 2018, the Disney Marvel studio Black Panther was an important landmark in that field, not only because the film featured for the first time a black superhero on the big screen, but also because of its huge budget and marketing hype, for a film uh, written and directed by uh, black artists. But despite the huge box office success worldwide of this film and others that followed, uh, the latest trend in Hollywood show that in 2019, uh, people of color remain largely underrepresented on the big screen with uh, about 33% of representation. And this is just an example as other minority or underrepresented groups follow the same path. But why is it so important to achieve greater diversity and inclusion on screen? Next slide, please. Because the content we watch on screen is supposed to reflect the society in all its facets and multiple dimensions, and everyone should be able to be represented in it. Because images are powerful and they impact on the construction of oneself and the representation we make of others. Images can carry with them stereotypes and discrimination based on racial or ethnic origin, age, sexual orientation, gender, and so on. And whether we are portrayed as a hero or as a gangster, as a housewife or as a scientific engineer does matter on self-representation and has a powerful impact on, on education. So in the path of the Oscar So White movement, things are changing in Europe too. And uh, in the next slides, you will see that a range of initiatives is popping up everywhere in Europe. We have already mentioned some of them in the first session. And we will see in session two uh, what kind of uh, best practices are put in place, uh, either from the film funds, the broadcasting sectors, from media regulators, or from the industry in general, to increase uh, the representation of uh, uh, diversity and inclusion on screen. So with these few words, I will hand over to my colleague Julio. I wish you very fruitful discussions and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sophie. You have given us a very solid foundation 
for further discussion. Now, without any further delay, I would like to introduce to you our first speaker. Um, we will have first Anna Serna, the CEO of the Swedish Film Institute. Anna was at the genesis of the 5050 by 2020 movement and has been an outspoken advocate of gender equality in the audiovisual sector. After that, we will have from the BBC, Miranda Whalen, Head of Creative Diversity. Prior to joining the BBC, she worked for ITB as Diversity Manager. Welcome, Miranda. And our third speaker will be Géraldine Van Il from the French regulator ESA. Géraldine has been in charge of the Women's Rights Working Group and is the head of the Diversity Working Group at the CSA. Now, um, let's get started, Anna. From your perspective at the Swedish Film Institute, uh, what can you tell us about the transition from a purely gender equality agenda to a much broader diversity and inclusion agenda? Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and thank you, Sophie, for the uh, presentation because I think that uh, you laid the ground there that makes us all understand the development that has actually happened. Uh, when we launched the 5050 uh, initiative in Sweden, it was 2013, uh, we invited uh, the world to our uh, party in Cannes and to 2013 and uh, there were a few reporters showing up mostly to drink drinks and uh, to enjoy themselves no one wrote about our work and action plan to receive a 50 50 funding uh, within four years uh, so we started off that work and i realized quite immediately that uh, it was very longed for within the grassroots mo movement. And uh, it has been very clear for me that the grassroots movements are really, really important. There are women in film and television groups in all parts of the world, and they are in constant contact with each other. So we met up and I were telling them what we were doing, uh, but it didn't come out into the official until in 2015, which was, was a groundbreaking year, not only because of Oscar So White, but as well because uh, stars like Kate Blanchett went up to the stage receiving her Oscar award and telling how it is being a woman. This made the world look at the inequality in the business at the same time. But Kate Blanchett is a white woman, and uh, she is really a part of the uh, established and privileged community in the world. Uh, the Hollywood star community is really privileged. Uh, so there was a very strong emphasis on the uh, gender equality issue, as it was the same for every woman. And I myself believe that I was really a part of this because. I didn't even realize that all these groups of women were really a majority white. But by the uh, Oscar So White hashtag and uh, the work that other grassroots made, it has become over the years clear that we do live in a structural racistic uh, system within the film industry and within the world, I would say. And it got clearer and clearer that me and my friends within these different groups were all white and we were questioned, rightfully questioned on all the festivals. Uh, and uh, we in Sweden decided that uh, it was time to actually look at ourselves to see if the work we were doing was really for all women or only for some women? And if so, which women? So we Anna, have been, yes? Anna, can I ask you, because I would like our audience uh, to know a little bit more about other schemes that you have, not only those uh, devoted to gender equality. I saw that you have a very interesting uh, scheme for uh, minority languages, 
Maybe you can tell us a little bit about this? Well, we do have an assignment that is overall uh, from the government saying that gender equality and uh, diversity should be uh, flagships of our industry. Uh, and within diversity, we, we have an intersectional approach. So from the gender equality perspective, we do the intersectional approach. But of course, we do need to focus on different groups as well isolated. So uh, we got a new assignment from the uh, authorities in Sweden to uh, actually make sure that the minority languages and stories were reflected in the film industry. And we have five minority languages in Sweden, and we have one uh, indigenous people. So that is one scheme that is very small, and it's, uh, it's really something that we will uh, develop. But then mm -hmm. we have other uh, smaller uh, schemes that are calls, really, just to emphasize or inspire other uh, groups to get their voices heard, so we can see that the gender equality work not only was targeted only towards white women. Uh, so we made this report, which is report which will be launched in English uh, in one month's time. It's called Witch Women, and it's about women of color and women of age. But we as well launched calls for uh, bigger budgets, as we did research on how the money in volume is actually not equal. Even though you get to do as many films, it's smaller budgets. So yeah, you present very, very precise statistics on that, and, and the difference, the gap is, is uh, amazing. I, I wonder if you could share with the audience uh, some future projects, if there is any themes that you plan to develop in the, in the near future in this direction of diversity and inclusion. Well, I would say that I'm chairing uh, the EFAD's gender, and nowadays gender and wider inclusion group. Uh, mm -hmm. which is a group that is uh, dealing with everything. And we are uh, working on uh, exchanging experiences from different countries, but as well actually trying to get the media program to uh, have a program for member countries to understand in what way they, on their level or platform, uh, can have a more inclusive industry. I think mm -hmm. we all need a lot more of uh, knowledge uh, in regards of this, uh, but we do need different kinds of knowledge depending on where we are right now, what country we are in. Uh, so that is what we are doing. We are trying to uh, uh, include uh, within our organization the voices that we have been excluding uh, in different ways, so we are not uh, a homogeneous group of people deciding uh, how to do things. We need to work more, more with the minority groups. So I think that is our most important next step, mm -hmm. is of course keeping on the work, but raising awareness through knowledge and uh, do some self-reflection. Before we move, thank you very much for that. Before we move to the next speaker, I would like to play the devil's advocate a little bit. I would like to ask you, what would you have to tell those who say that uh, funding or public support should be conducted on the basis of creativity and, and quality itself and not on the basis of diversity? Well, I would say that uh, if you don't take the whole balance, uh, talent base into consideration by being discriminatory, uh, you will never reach the highest quality and highest creativity. Uh, it's not within someone's sex or gender that the creativity lies. It's in the voices and perspectives and the gathering of voices that are meeting that we actually do have the uh, development uh, of our creative industry. 
So I would say to them that uh, uh, don't be afraid, just be inspired. Thank you very much, Anna. It was really insightful. Now I would like to move to our next speaker, Miranda Whalen from BBC. I don't know if we get you on the screen. There you are. Hello and welcome. Hi. I will. Uh, I would like to ask you what has been done so far at the BBC when it comes to on-screen diversity, and whether you are able to draw some conclusions from your work so far. Miranda, please go ahead. Thank you. In reflection to on-screen diversity, I think this year has been quite a phenomenal year, uh, not just for our organisation, but globally. With the pandemic and the killing of George Floyd, it really amplified the need to see audiences reflected better in our content. The richness of stories, to see that being authentic, no, no longer relying on stereotypes, exceptions, has been quite profound. And I think within our sector, We've all had a greater look at how we are conveying that, that representation in all facets on screen, on air and online. I think what's been interesting about the way we've gone about looking at diversity since the killing of George Floyd is it's particularly shown a spotlight around ethnicity representation. And in doing so, we have to be very mindful that we don't discount or start ranking other forms of diversity as we try to correct the imbalance. The presentation I want to share with you now is really looking at what we've been doing to address some of that both on air and off air and looking at how our audiences um, are thinking about representation through a medium that isn't able to rely on visual cues and I'm hoping that you can see that. Are you able to see my screen, my presentation? Yeah. yeah. Right. So as I mentioned, um, using radio as a platform that can connect with people in their homes, um, generating stories and therefore more poignant in making sure that those, those communities, their voices and their lived experience are heard throughout. It's important for us also to reflect that we don't have those visual cues in which they can absolutely feel that they're being represented and their voices and stories are being heard. Two sides of that coin, obviously on air representation and off air. So I'm going to walk through um, on air. And it was great to hear about the 5050 project, which has been quite profound for us at the BBC in looking at gender um, equality and therefore making the whole diversity journey less of a tick box and less of a compliance component. I, it's been great to see how well received gender equality has been um, at the BBC and equally how we've been able to utilise that, that brand and that ethos to be able to make that reflective with other partners. The core principle is obviously to collect data to effect a change, for us to be able to measure those who are contributing into our stories and making sure those stories are authentic and never to compromise on quality. Often we hear conversations about, well, if I'm more inclusive, do I need to lower the bar of expectation of those underrepresented under groups? 5050 makes it very clear that we're not looking to lower the bar, but we're looking to expand our remit of voices. And through those voices, we can tell authentic stories that engages our audiences. Within the BBC, we have over 600 outlets within the BBC that have embraced 5050 to make sure that their content is truly reflective of the female perspective. We've noticed from those who have engaged with us that 39% have seen a shift towards not just female representation, but stories and attitudes. 40% have seen a growth for that hard to reach uh, target audience of 16 to 34 and 32% of women aged 25 to 34 consume more of our content as a result of it. We now have expanded the 5050 project to work with 75 partners in 25 countries. It's phenomenal in such a short space of time how progressive this tool has been in making greater representation, not just within our sector, but for other organizations who are grappling with this issue. 
when I think about off air, what can we do to make sure the successes that we're seeing with tools like 5050 can be re replicated elsewhere? Often a financial injection is called for. So within radio, we've made a 12 million uh, pound investment, which kicks in on the 1st of April to do just that. Alongside that, we've also introduced new targets and looking at the different components of our radio portfolio between BBC Radio and Music, they have a new 15% workforce target. And then within uh, with our suppliers, we have a 20% diversity target. The 15% aligns to our current workforce strategy and the 20% now is being introduced um, for our suppliers so they can be more progressive as we know our population is changing radically. Driving change, we're no longer about demising what inclusion will look like for the future and debating how we go about it. It's about creating change. We do a lot of talking and often talk ourselves out of actually doing something productive. So the focus for the creative diversity team and the BBC overall is to lead with action and to deliver on what we know to be true for better representation. Within radio, they're signed up to the equality in audio pack, which is really making sure that representation in every form, whether in public speaking, whether in our, our program making or who we work with, are thinking about inclusion and adopting it in their practices. We no longer want to sit on panels that aren't reflective, so we must lead by example. We're also um, investing in new opportunities. I think what we've seen in the UK in particular is we rely on entry level to correct some of the absences we see at senior to middle. So we want to be able to create opportunities throughout the life cycle of our audio industry that helps to push progression. Again, something that's uh, spearheaded in Five Live is a mentoring program. So all of our on-air talent will now be mentoring the next generation coming through. It's about investing in the future and backing the talent that we want to see. These initiatives and more, we hope, will also correct and address some of the issues around socioeconomic diversity not new to our industry, but new in terms of how we approach it and how we evidence it. We also want to do something that helps our sector overall. We have, as our brand is strong, the opportunity to take people on a journey with us. The Creative Allies Programme is a tool that's been designed by BBC Academy and the USC institution to be able to help people to be great advocates and allies and champions. The tool takes the principle of the privilege um, game in a physical form and brings it online, giving you the opportunity to look at some of the advantages and disadvantages that people have in your organization and in the sector that often stops progression. It walks you through things that you could do to help balance that out and pinpoint seven different types of advocates that you could be to be able to champion equality and inclusion. Whether it's being a voice that stands up against injustice and inequality, whether or not you become a champion for somebody who's not in your team but needs profiling and recognition, whether or not you become a sponsor to somebody are just some of the ways that we think will be really helpful to making sure that we have greater inclusion. Supported by some of the big CEOs across the creative industry, such as Bauer and, Oft and the Fashion Broadcasting Foundation, we're able to make sure that this is a tool that can be utilised for all, not just for the BBC. As I said, it's a tool that you can find on our BBC Creative Diversity website, and I would encourage you to go in there, have a play and see what you can learn about yourself in terms of being a great ally for someone new. And last but not least is the language guide. We know that language is a powerful tool. It's what brings us together and ultimately we are in the communication industry. So making sure that we have the right language to not only connect with our colleagues, on, but also our on-air and on-screen contributors and audiences. You'll have seen in our past history that language has gotten us into a bit of trouble. And so what we want to be able to do is provide a guide that supports our content makers 
to understand societal changes and offer potential alternatives that they could use in being able to connect with others and to make sure that those underserved and underrepresented audiences feel that they are being reflected in all of our output. Thank you very much. That was really interesting, a lot of information to digest now. I would like to ask you a question. You mentioned uh, a mentoring, um, and I have read in many places uh, throughout Europe that one of the reasons for mentoring and, and uh, programs to, to attract uh, cast, uh, new journalists, et cetera, are due to the fact that there is a shortage of journalists, actors, uh, uh, and, and this kind of, of uh, people from those origins, from minority groups, from... from uh, so would you agree with this? I think in part, it, I think it's quite an interesting one because what we're finding in the UK is that there is a pipeline for diverse talent, but within uh, certain diverse groups, the pipeline is very minimal. So, for example, if you look at disability and acting, we're not seeing in the academics, in the acting world, that there are a number of disabled um, actors coming through. And that's a throwback to the fact that we don't have disabled roles for which uh, our institutions are, are feeling that it's pretty pointless teaching our disabled actors when actually we're still not even casting them. So I think in some areas, absolutely, there is a pipeline issue. I think as a broadcaster, we have to do our part to make sure that when we say we want diverse people on and off screen, we are pushing back when we're seeing a casting list that isn't diverse, making sure that our sets are inclusive for diverse and disabled actors that actually audition. And equally to work with academics to make sure that the targets we set for ourselves are accurately communicated to others. Really interesting. I really thank you for your contribution. Thank I think our, our audience will also appreciate it. Now, um, we have a lot of information to process, and, and the next presentation will be with uh, Geraldine, who also has a lot to share with us. Um, I wonder, hello, Geraldine. I wonder what, what you can tell us about this uh, great tool that you have implemented, the Barometer on Diversity which are the indicators that you use and how mm -hmm. you came to the conclusion that those are the right indicators. Geraldine, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Julio. So my talk today is about the diversity barometer and how it can help the media to improve their diversity level on screen. Um, let me start with the methodology of this tool uh, that was created in 2009. Uh, in this study, we analyzed programs of broadcast on 18 TV channels released during two weeks from 5 to 11 p.m. Uh, we chose this time slot because it covers the largest audience of the television. Every program is observed, fiction, news, magazines, documentary, entertainment, sports, except the ad. Uh, the study makes up over more than 1,200 hours of broadcast and 40,000 speaking characters. Uh, the speaking characters are quasi qualified, uh, classified sorry, according to a quantitative criteria. We have the ethnic origin, the sex, the profession, disability, the age, the place of residence, the poverty situation, and according to a qualitative criteria, the status, whether it's a hero, a main character, or a secondary character, the attitude, whether the speaking character has a positive, a negative, or a neutral attitude, uh, you can cross uh, the criteria. And a weighting is applied depending on the duration of the program and the status. Every result is compared to the French population, except for the ethnic origin, because we cannot make ethnical statistics uh, in France. Good. Going on to the next slide. Um, by developing the study, the CSA had to face some problems. The biggest issue we faced is the fact 
that uh, ethnical statistics are not allowed in France. Uh, so we can count people on screen according to diversity characteristics. Uh, we just uh, don't know the ethnicity level of the French population. Uh, to answer a question you might all have, uh, in fact, a decision of the Constitutional Council uh, said it's possible to have ethnical information in data when the aim is to fight against discrimination and in a defined sector. The second problem was that, according to the law, personal information should not appear in database. Uh, so we had to be careful that the data of the study uh, didn't uh, include any names. Uh, another problem the CSA has to face is the critic. It's important to say that this study is a very solid ground for us because researchers of French university uh, took part in the development of its methodology. Furthermore, the CSA listened to the critics of the media and made changes to the methodology in order to make this instrument uh, acceptable to all parties. These changes concern mainly the addition of qualitative aspect. And the last problem was that the CSA's duty is on screen. And we know that broadcasters are failing to represent society when they have a lack of diversity uh, among staff. Going on to the next slide, um, here's what we found. People of color are only 15% of speaking characters in 2019, and since 2009, the rate is not getting higher than 17%. Moreover, uh, the report found that non-white speaking uh, characters are mostly represented as secondary characters. Um, you can see there uh, that some positive developments have been made by the media. We observed that people of color were more likely to be positively represented, and mainly in fiction, 48% uh, of them. Uh, on the next graph here, you can see that uh, women make up just over half the French population, but only 39% of speaking character and that those roles were more likely to be discriminated when they accumulate to discrimination criteria. For instance, in those graphs, uh, women in situation of poverty or disabled women represent only 29% of the speaking characters. On the next slide, uh, you can see this slide is full of color. On these graphs, we are seeing an erasure of certain groups on TV compared to uh, the general population. Only 0.7% uh, of disabled pe people are on TV. Only 0.8% uh, people in situation of poverty are on TV and only 7% of people are living in the suburb on TV, whereas uh, they represent 27% of the French population. Um, we are getting to the end of my talk, uh, and I still have some little things to say. Well, these numbers are important because everyone deserves to have their stories told and see themselves on screen. It's really about not creating a disconnection between the people in the programs and the many millions who watch them. Therefore, it's important to work with the media in order to improve these results and how it works well, concretely, a report with the global results is published. We do uh, no naming and shaming, and uh, individual results are shared with the media. Then uh, the media use the studies data to make concrete commitments for the next year, and they can also develop specific strategies. These commitments and strategies are discussed and agreed by the CSA. Uh, what I would like to say to finish is that um, this report is a very good example of a co-regulation system. For the time being, it worked quite well, but we still got a lot to do. Uh, it's important to understand that the counting is the very beginning of how you make changes and progress for the media.
Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. Thank you very much. It was really interesting. I, I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit more of information on the qualitative part. I see that you mentioned uh, that you track the status of the character, the attitude, yeah. the role. I suppose you produce statistics with this. Could you tell the audience how this exactly works? Well, as I said, for each characteristics the each character sorry the 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 status whether it's a hero a main character or secondary character and the attitude whether the speaking character has a positive a negative or a neutral attitude are recorded uh, when we have that um, we have an intersectional approach we can crush all the characteristic to know uh, for example we know, for example, the rate of women positively represented in fiction mm -hmm. or uh, the rate of people of color portrayed as hero. So crossing characteristics uh, can show us not only if people are represented on TV, but also how they are represented on TV. Exactly, and because when, this is probably yeah. one of the main issues. It's, it's not only how much, but how good or how bad. Yeah, yeah. And we were surprised to find, for example, that uh, you are more discriminated uh, when you accumulate discrimination criteria. And the last thing uh, you must know is that a weighting is applied to all speaking characters depending on the duration of the program and the status. Uh, it goes from one to six. For example, you have a coefficient six for a hero when the program lasts more than five minutes and the coefficient 5 for hero when the program lasts less than five minutes, and the same thing for the main characters and the secondary characters. Really interesting. I think our, our audience will appreciate reading your, your, your reports. Thank you very much, Geraldine, uh, for you. this uh, excellent presentation. Now, without any further delay, I would like to move on to the second part of our session, which is the discussion. For this, we will have five participants. I would like to welcome Claudia Baccarone, joining us from Geneva. She is an independent media expert who previously worked for EBU, where she authored the report, All Things Being Equal. We will be also joined by the European Commission. Uh, from Brussels, we have Sarah Brunet, a policy officer uh, in charge of gender equality within Creative Europe at the European Commission. Also joining us from Brussels, uh, I would like to welcome Justina Raisite, Head of Development and Policy at the EASA, the European Advertising Standards Alliance, who will give us the perspective of, of one of the stakeholders uh, we have not yet introduced, the advertising sector. We also have uh, Teresa Muñoz from Madrid, working for the public Spanish broadcaster RTV. Hello, Teresa. Uh, she is a manager in charge of gender equality at the recently created uh, Wellbeing, Gender Equality and Diversity Department. And last, but certainly not least, joining us from Dublin, welcome to Stephanie Comey, a senior manager with the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland, BAI where she developed a couple of years ago its gender action plan. So I would like to start with you, Claudia. Um, we have discussed before uh, the barometer, one of the many available tools. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit on other possible tools. And uh, I would also ask you to, to elaborate a bit on something which has been very briefly mentioned which is intersectionality. Maybe you can give our audience a clue or, or a, a, an explanation or, of what exactly it is. Claudia, the floor is yours. With pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julio and Maya, for organizing such a comprehensive and actionable workshop. 
I'm really delighted to be here today and to listen also and learn from so many committed professionals. Um, so in terms of um, measurement, I mean, we have been hearing from some of the groundbreaking and uh, most important uh, um, initiatives and the tools that, are, that have been already deployed for quite some time now. We heard about the BBC 5050, which is rolling out globally. We heard about how um, the CSA and like the CSA and the CSA, both the French one and the Belgian one, they have uh, there's a lot of other uh, audiovisual authorities and regulators that um, have been uh, developing these type of reports and demand for data. Um, all this is unbelievably important, but uh, it's still, um, I would say, requests and demands some complements because as we can see, sometimes the data refers only to like a period of time or um, it's in any case still not very easy to collect. And I think that there's an urgent need to have in place some harmonized and performing technology, uh, technology-based measurement tools, um, because only the objectivity of the comprehensive data can push high on the agenda and can help holding leaders and organizations accountable. We've seen some peaks in that sense. With the use of artificial intelligence, we've been seeing a couple of examples. It started out with the Gina Davis Foundation a couple of years ago, focusing on uh, movies in, in Hollywood. And they, she partnered with Google and developed this AI-based algorithm that showed uh, you know, objective data on all the movies produced in a given year. Um, and uh, you know, show, showcase the, the huge discrepancy between not only um, the number of men and women uh, on screen, but also uh, the speaking time. Uh, and then other examples using the same technologies are coming from France, the INA, uh, l'Institut National de l'Audiovisuel. I think it was in 2018, published a similar study on French content. Uh, covering uh, a span of 20 years, and it showed that uh, same thing. There was like men and women, you know, it was based on gender, and it showed that women are still hugely underrepresented. And what it was striking was that that 70% men, 30% women um, was basically stable in the last 20 years. Um, and there's other examples of these type of technologies coming from Stanford. There was a study made by Geraldine Moriba. Um, focusing more on news organizations. So we're starting to see these tools. And my, one of the messages that I would like to share is, I think that everybody you know, involved in this in Europe needs to start looking at AI and needs to start developing you know, this, type of, uh, this type of powerful tools. Um, then, you know, something else that I wanted to react um, on is the fact that before we got into inter intersectionalities, is that we, I see a worrying trend personally and a big risk that we are replacing the cause of gender equality in media with diversity measures. Um, we're seeing sometimes all these new comprehensive, impressive and absolutely necessary diversity programs, including gender equality as one of the categories. But let's not forget, women are 51% of the population. And so in terms of representation and especially on screen and on air, they remain a priority. And as I mentioned before, the few studies that are, um, that are available uh, showcase that we're still far away you know, from that 50-50. Um, there was another study that came out two weeks ago from uh, Nordicom um, that will, uh, was focusing more on the world of news, for instance, and they basically uh, projected that it will take 70 years before we have gender parities in the news segment. And if we look at some other areas of media, like broadcasting sports uh, or technology broadcasting, it's even worse. Um, so let's, you know, let's not throw away the women cause. Let's keep on, you know, let's keep on having those uh, objectives. Let's keep on aiming for that 50-50 and not 30% of women by 2025, but like 50-50 by as soon as possible. And then you also asked, talk about intersectionality. So intersectionality strategies, if we, in, basically, um, intersectionality is a framework that considers how different types of discrimination can overlap and impact further specific groups. Like, you know, you can be a woman, but you can be black. And so you're double, you know, at risk of discriminations or Asian and disabled. Um, and so having that kind of lens uh, should be, uh, I would say, like a preferred strategy uh, to address both causes, to keep on advancing the women cause, but at the same time start addressing all of the issues that we've seen today. 
we heard also from the BBC about commissioning for content, um, having also like specific quotas, uh, like it is the case in some uh, uh, leading organizations. I have on, on mind the example of CBC Radio Canada, which has been doing this for years, can really help driving different type of content. So thank you, thank you very much, Claudia. It was a lot of information in one go. I, I think that the audience will digest it and, and they will really appreciate it. Now we are running out of time. I would like to move now um, to our next uh, discussant. So I know, uh, could we have uh, Sarah Brunet on screen? I know that the, the commission uh, has taken diversity and inclusion very seriously. It's gaining momentum. Now, I wonder how this is translated, is, is translating, sorry, or will translate in the near future into your uh, Creative Europe policies and strategies. Tara, the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, this is obvious. Of course, let me uh, first say that um, European Commission and the media program are, of course, committed to improve gender balance from representativeness, anti-discrimination, inclusiveness, social inequality behind and in front of the camera. Uh, as you all know, we have a new president uh, here already, and we are currently discussing the next media program, which will be launched uh, in 2021 for the next seven years. And uh, currently we are discussing with uh, our DJ Justice colleagues to um, implement uh, no horizontal criteria uh, and ask a minimum effort to applicants uh, as regard to gender balance and diversity. So I cannot go further in detail because uh, all of these are um, uh, currently discussed, and uh, the next media program is not adopted yet. But uh, this is just to say that we are, uh, this is um, up on the agenda. And uh, of course, uh, we all also want them to uh, apply, maybe um, to commit themselves more formally to EU values. And uh, like uh, the ones that are um, specified in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights and the Treaty on European Union. And uh, with media, uh, we have started a global agenda early 2019, and we, we have done a lot uh, closely with stakeholders as regard to uh, data collection studies, uh, also good practices guide and uh, networking events. But yes, we want to enlarge and move from gender balance to a global block uh, that we can entitle diversity, but in fact that is to say anti-discrimination. And we strongly believe that if we improve the situation, as regards to the um, diverse, uh, if we have more diverse teams, we will have a more diverse content. And um, so this is the the main action uh, to, to work on this horizontal criteria. Yes, sorry? Do I understand correctly that at least uh, for the time being, it's not foreseen to set specific concrete criteria for the applications to, to uh, Creative Europe support, right? Yes, right. It's uh, our, um, we are discussing uh, technically uh, the possibility to implement this horizontal criteria for all uh, support measures. And mm -hmm. uh, the idea is to ask for minimum effort to applicants. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. Tara, thank you very much for uh, joining us and for letting know about the Commission's plans, even if you couldn't uh, give us all the details, because this is, of course, work in progress and, and to be seen. But uh, I think the audience will really appreciate it. Now, we are moving to the advertising sector. For this, uh, I would like to ask Justina 
Um, what I have seen uh, done by the advertising industry in terms of diversity is very impressive. Now, I wonder is if this is a public relations action or uh, is it really effective as a commercial tool or is there a balance among the two things? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Julio. Uh, and first and foremost, thanks a lot to uh, European Audiovisual Observatory and specifically to yourself and Maya for inviting me and EASA in this really fascinating wor workshop. And to start, I just want to say that we, as a network of responsible advertising industry stakeholders, truly hold these values of non-discrimination, respectful portrayal, uh, as well as the avoidance of harmful stereotyping at the very core of the principles that are, in fact, enshrined in the calls and uh, in the codes and advertising standards of our independent self-regulatory organizations that are indeed the ones enforcing the self-regulatory standards, rules, and principles all, all across Europe. But now to answer directly to your question, I want to start exactly from there, because apart from the codes that are defending us uh, against discriminatory advertising, there are also those active industry players, uh, part of our membership. So the advertisers, brands, the media that very uh, actively stand for uh, progressive and diverse um, representation of society in advertising, in commercial communications. And to answer your question, why? First and foremost, they do in fact see that diverse and inclusive ads are good for business, not only in terms of building consumer loyalty, as you can see on the screen, building brand image, but also adding to that bottom line, to the ad effectiveness. We see that the majority of the consumers um, are actually valuing uh, authenticity as one of the most important factors in terms of choosing which uh, brands and, and which uh, ads to trust. And trust, as we all know, is truly a gold standard uh, in terms of uh, commercial communications and marketing. For brand image, we see the same kinds of possible improvements uh, uh, and increase of consumer perception perception, positive perception for the um, advertising that shows multidimensional um, society. As well as finally, in terms of progressive non-stereotyping ads, uh, they are delivering more than 25% uh, gains in terms of effectiveness and also higher purchasing intent. But beyond that, we are, of course, having those good practices from the brands that want to say what they stand in terms of uh, what types of values and what types of principles they represent. So here, just a few examples of such good practices that you've probably also, as consumers, seen recently on the screens. One that comes from Gillette uh, in terms of first shave, and uh, again, indeed, dep depicts a transgender teen having its first shave. Uh, why this? Uh, I chose this uh, campaign to show, uh, showcase today is specifically because this brand previously has been known as kind of very manly, very macho-based image, um, portraying masculinity in a very specific way. And they indeed took a stand um, in terms of representing more diverse groups and also consumer base that they wanted to attract. And the ad, uh, despite having some very controversial reactions, uh, in the end indeed created a lot of positive impact for the brand. Another example in terms of uh, diversity in um, and the disability aspect or issue uh, comes from Microsoft that not only changed the product line introduced new products, but also followed that up with a very creative ad campaign that, as you can see in um, some of the evidence presented on the slide, also resulted in them being most effective ad among the Super Bowl ads that year. Finally, another, another diversity group in which, um, not diversity group, but the group in which uh, frankly speaking, gets marginalized um, in terms of advertising, especially when we talk about uh, fashion advertising, is of course related to age. Uh, interestingly so, uh, the kind of, um, I would say, uh, society um, society part that we will all eventually issue as we all uh, will all fall into as we all age of course and so here L'Oreal and uh, L'Oreal Paris partnered with Vogue uh, to challenge the stereotypes of not portraying enough people of the older age um, in the fashion related uh, magazines uh, fashion related advertising and again created a massively uh, successful campaign showing that this type of portrayal again attracts consumers and create that massive appeal. However, now I also want to say that when there are a lot of good, inspiring examples these days that we can gather, there are also a lot of ads that 
need to be stopped from being broadcasted to consumers or displayed to consumers. And here are just a few of examples of the ads that received, compl they received complaints from the consumers all across Europe and therefore were, of course, withdrawn. As you can see, such slogans and non-nasty imports uh, related to a negative uh, portrayal of immigration, uh, of ethnicity, and this uh, kind of prompt of very, um, I would say, damaging uh, nationalism does not have place in our responsible advertising ecosystem. The same with uh, slogans that, of course, are very disrespectful in terms of, in this case, uh, Black Lives Matter movement and create a lot of negative associations. So these kinds of ads that our organizations, self-regulatory organizations, help to stop. Here, I also believe that no further comments are needed. Just the question, why on earth um, some of, in this case, cosmetic brands showed to portray uh, their cause um, or showed to portray uh, their slogan, their brand, in this specific really damaging and stereotyping way. But I also want to showcase that as diverse as we are in the society, it also reflects in some of the consumer com complaints, particularly conservative consumer complaints against progressive ads. Here you can see the snapshots from some of the ads that uh, indeed are portraying um, uh, progressive or not even progressive, specifically homosexual gay couples in respectively uh, coffee and um, uh, jewelry uh, commercials, and they also receive complaints from the European consumers, in which cases, of course, such complaints are rejected. They have nothing against, um, those ads have nothing against the, the values that enshrined in self-regulatory codes, but the self-regulatory organizations Justina, here. Justina, I'm, I'm going to have to stop you there because we're, we really have to move on. Uh, but I Fine. really have to. I, th I think I, I said my, my main point here. So thank you so yeah, much for again yeah. having that. And, and it's really interesting that you uh, explain the two the two sides. You know the the positive examples, but also the negative examples. Really appreciate it. I'm sure our our audience will also appreciate it. So I, without any further delay, I move now to Teresa, our next uh, discussant. Um, I think you will uh, tell us about a new gender equality scheme that uh, RTB just launched, but you will mainly talk about a very good example of uh, content produced to foster diversity. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, we've just launched uh, a guide um, on how to, to use language in a non-sexist way and how to, to portray with gender perspective, and this is what we are now um, using with all our journalists and our creative content people. But as you said, as we are going to talk about diversity, I I wanted to share our our case with diversity. Now, we as a public service media have a responsibility to promote and invest in a more inclusive, diverse service with the aim of being an agent of change in our society. Our constitution and our laws give us the legal frame in order to outline our broadcasting service and we have to be a strategic asset to achieve a better and fairer so uh, social organization. And we are committed with diversity. We have many programs in our radio and TV channels dedicated to disability, different ethnic origins, sexual orientations, religions. And some of these programs have been on air for more than 30 years. And of course, we do have uh, news programs, debates, and documentaries and educational programs that approach diversity. But now we are aware that it is not enough, that it's mandatory to take a step forward and start to work harder on inclusion. Now we are preparing and creating a statement on regards both diversity and inclusion to make sure that awareness on these topics is present in our content creation process and acquisitions process as well. During, as an example, I can say that uh, during this last season, for example, we've broadcasted a serial drama called Hit, which I think it's a good example um, reflecting a, a diverse society. It's the story about a group of teenagers with behavioral issues and the new teacher that arrives in the high school to try to redirect the situation. The cast itself is diverse and we will see different ethnicities, beliefs, sexual orientations, economical backgrounds, people with dis uh, disabilities, but none of these topics and characteristics are key part to the to the main plot. The diversity is is shown just as a picture of our our society and and it's treated not falling into stereotypes. The importance of this serial is that it's oriented to young audiences, 
but to their elders too. So it helps to 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 create a place to meet and talk about education, integration, inclusion, respect, and all of them are important topics to highlight from uh, public service media. So with this um, type of programs, what we want to do is um, keep on working on this track of showing not only diversity, but inclusion in our society. Thank you, Teresa. It was really interesting. I can only say that uh, being a Spaniard myself, I went to look for information on the series, and it seems it's going to be something really big over there in Spain. Now, we have time for a couple of questions only from the audience. Uh, the first one goes to Geraldine from the CSA. Um, Brigitte Monod wonders if you're planning uh, any uh, coercive measures uh, towards broadcasters in order for them to improve their results on diversity. Uh, no, because uh, the law uh, does not oblige the CSA to take uh, coercive measures. So for the time, we won't uh, take coercive me measures, but we would like that the media um, measure themselves and monitor themselves uh, the diversity <coughs> level on their screen and set clear diversity targets. So, okay, I think that answers the question. Now, uh, we also got another question for my colleague Sophie Ballet. Uh, one person would like to know if um, the reports that you mentioned that were done in Hollywood or in the States, if there is something similar in Europe. Hello. Uh, well, uh, uh, for the preparation of this workshop, I have looked for uh, uh, comparable figures at pan-European level about on-screen representation, and I, I couldn't find it. Uh, where there are many uh, figures at national level, but uh, my conclusion uh, for this preparation was that uh, there is not a common approach uh, at European level at the moment. Now, as I answered in the chat, uh, we are going to prepare a report at the European Audiovisual Observatory on this specific topic of diversity and inclusion on and off screen. Uh, that will be published uh, in uh, next spring, uh, and uh, we will use all this content that has been discussed today, and we will continue to look into uh, further uh, figures and reports. So if we find something, uh, we will certainly uh, include it in our report. But uh, so far, the, the, I used the Hollywood example because uh, this is uh, the only uh, uh, comparable figures that I could find uh, in the States. Okay. So we have the last uh, discussant. I would like to pin now on Stephanie. Hello. So could you tell us very briefly uh, some examples of what you are doing at the BAI? Thanks very much, Julio, and I will be uh, I will be fast. Um, thank you for the invitation, and thank you for a very very stimulating uh, debate and conversation today. Uh, there is a lot to take away, so I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I think in the BAI, um, like many of the previous speakers and the previous examples uh, that have been given, we have focused on um, uh, gender and Irish language. Irish language is, um, is it's a national language in Ireland, but it's spoken by a minority of people, and therefore it enjoys special protections. Um, so we've we've definitely put a lot of work on those two areas first. I can't say, and we are now moving to towards, I suppose, broader diversity and inclusion, and we see the, the Gender and Action and Irish Language Action Plan as a platform for, for starting this work. I can say that, unfortunately, we have great achievements on uh, diversity and, and, and inclusion to date, but we believe that we have useful templates. Um, and I'm going to give two, uh, I think, that I, uh, I might be helpful. The first one is something that we did under the Gender Action Plan. It's a, an initiative called Women's Stories, where we uh, provided funding for program makers, both on radio and television, 
um, to uh, come in uh, uh, and, and tell us women's stories over a range of genres and a range of uh, formats. Uh, and the idea there was simply to enlarge the potential amounts of perspective of programmes that are normally funded by the BAI. Um, we wanted to change the narrative. And we believe that this uh, template is actually quite helpful and can be uh, replicable and transferable to other diversity and inclusion aims. Uh, in terms of Irish language, we're currently working with uh, an initiative that is called Gluan Nua in Irish, which means new generation. And it's an interesting one because it's multi-stakeholder. It's a cross-border partnership with Northern Ireland. That's always a very important point for us here. Um, and we aim a training so it's both on screen and off screen. We aim at training young professionals, including actors, in um, writing or directing or acting in the Irish language. And we hope that this will result in content that actually targets young people. And the key here is really that it's both a talent development initiative with training, uh, but it's also the creation of new content, uh, digital content and broadcast content for new audiences. And we feel that the multi-stakeholder aspect of this is very very important. So I would say um, to to kind of finish here, the two elements I think that um, uh, regulators like ourselves and other key players in the industry can do is really to focus on engaging um, uh, the multiplicity of stakeholders that exist, because it's working together that will deliver those aims, and also to um, scale up or down or sideways, any other initiatives that have been uh, developed in terms of promoting more diversity in general. Uh, we absolutely understand that women are not a minority, but the initiatives that have um, served women well in uh, the sector over the last number of years can also uh, be used as platforms for broader diversity and inclusion. Um, and you. I think I might stop here. Yeah, thank you very much. It was also a lot of information. I think uh, it will be the same for, for most uh, participants, for most uh, attendees, that they will have to digest all this information. So I think it's time to conclude now. I'm going to hand it over to Maya for a final wrap up. I think we learned that uh, gender equality was what ignited and inspired uh, DNI policies and actions. We also learned that there is still a lot of things to do. And we got a lot of good examples from the different sectors and perspectives. So I thank you all for this uh, fruitful discussion and for the presentations. And ball over to you, Maya. Thank you, Julio. Um, I will maybe just give um, me the, the key points looking at the two sessions. Um, I think we have identified that there is a sort of misalignment in time uh, with regard to the evolutions that uh, are happening with regard to off-screen and on-screen. That off-screen is going a bit faster than off-screen, than, than on-screen, maybe also because there are more legal obligations in place, so it's uh, also easier to, uh, to go forward in a, in a more quick, in a quicker manner. But then what is done positively for off screen will also be is being reflected uh, on screen. Then we have the issue of data gathering. Uh, here we have clearly seen that this is a, a long and exhausting uh, exercise where the differences in national legislations can play a role also in terms of obstacles. It's difficult to find comparable data and there is uh, definitely a need for good studies and report out there. And then the third point I would like to mention, which I found very interesting, is the one on intersection and normalization of the issue. Uh, and so far, it, it is an exercise that one has to do because of our obligation. Uh, this is, of course, uh, never going to win over what is done successfully on a voluntary basis because the product is successful. So as soon as the, the, the discourse becomes normal, then it will become also easier. And intersection means also that we uh, shall not forget the major categories uh, and leave them behind. There were some worries expressed that gender issues might be forgotten in the name of other sectors that should be promoted as well. So it's important to, to keep an eye 
on all the issues. I think we have uh, gathered a lot of good material for our next steps. As was mentioned by my colleague Sophie, uh, we will work on a, on a report now. So on behalf of the team, myself, uh, Julio Talavera, uh, Sophie Valle, and Francisco Cabrera, I would like to thank you all for this great contribution. And uh, I will mention again the, our distinguished speakers. We had Amy Turton from Diamond, Pauline Durandiai from Fera, Daphne Tepper from Union Europa, joined in session one on off screen by Stefan Trömmel from uh, International Labour Organization, Camille Laville from the Belgian regulator CSA, Karasana from Netflix, Kila Rorero from the European Disability Forum, Laura Holgat from Unique, and Halbert Gorset from the Council of Europe. And they were followed by another group of great speakers from our second session who dealt with the, the on screen issues, Anna Serner from the Swedish Film. Miranda Weyland from BBC, Geraldine Van Hill from the French Regulator CESA, Claudia Vaccarone, media expert, Sarah Brunet from the European Commission, Justina Recite from the European Standards Alliance, Teresa Munoz from the Spanish broadcaster RTVE, and Stephanie Comey from the Irish Regulator BIA. It was great to have you on board. Uh, you have brought together also thanks to the interaction of the audience a lot of good stuff. We will download both the chat box and the comments box for our future work. Thank you also for interacting with the audience. This made our job also easier. We had uh, Lea Chauchon very active uh, hiding behind the scenes and uh, also Alison Handa for the vision mixing. The recording speaking about vision will be available on our website together with also the presentation who will be uploaded. So stay tuned, follow our work, and happy uh, Human Rights Day. And I think it was just brilliant to touch upon this topic on this important celebration. Have a lovely evening, everyone, and also a nice closing of this uh, very unusual year. Goodbye from Strasbourg, everyone. Thank you.